Thank, thank you very much for a very, very interesting um, presentation. Um, what struck me, even though your overall uh, outlook is really tending to pessimism on the, on the extent to which uh, fossil fuels will um, shrink as part of the energy mix, I'm wondering whether you're actually being too optimistic on the resilience of nuclear, given the reaction post Fukushima and the reluctance of many, many countries to invest in nuclear for the future, and whether you're overlooking the incredible resilience of coal, which, uh, when it comes to cost, is the cheapest fossil fuel, um, and in fact is, is enjoying quite a renaissance uh, because of the high cost of gas in Europe, for example, where the Dutch and the Germans are burning more coal because of the cost of, of, of the alternatives. Um, so going from 81 to 76, aren't you actually being rather optimistic given the trends we're seeing right now with particular relevance to coal and nuclear? Well, I was, <coughs> I was almost sure of this. But uh, you know, on nuclear, as you've seen probably on, on the slide, I'm using 6%. We are using. And we used to say 7 Six, in fact, is unchanged. But unchanged in, in an energy demand which is growing. So to make the six, it means that we have to continue to build, not only to rebuild existing capacities, but to build new ones. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe today that we are optimistic. But I mean, if I say this, it means as far as we will not be moving quicker on renewables, it means that there will be even more need of fossils. And then people will say, aha, again, they are doing this to comfort their own business. It's very strange to see that an oil and gas company could be considered responsible for nuclear. But that's the way it will be. So mm -hmm. I prefer to say this figure is probably optimistic for nuclear. But until further notice, even if we know what's happening after Fukushima, I mean, that's the way it is. And if I change it, and if we change it to five or four, it will not change the debate. That's why, I mean, be careful with figures. That's still not so important. Now, it's true that after Fukushima, a lot of things have changed, and especially access to coal. But that's where people, and I don't want to mention any country, especially one next to France, but everybody knows who, which it is, well, it's true, it's trained to talk about climate change and the planet concern and switching from nuclear to coal. But, you know, I am just stupid, so I don't understand. <laughs> and uh, I just said before that economy shouldn't be running the politics. It should be life. So if life is really a problem of emissions, well, certainly people moving from oil to coal, I'm joking, but from nuclear to coal, I'm making a mistake. Now, at the same time in Japan, as you probably know, but I mean, in Japan it's different. I mean, you have to be, I mean, not generous, it's not a word, but I mean, pragmatic. Mm -hmm. I mean, this country has been suffering a lot, and I must say, I'm still admiring them. At the same time, today they cannot swallow more gas. They need to build new power plants. Those today, which are to be used for gas, are already fully used for gas. So today, if they want energy, they have no other possibility than to use coal, and even worse, to use, as I've never seen since now 25 years when I was young, or 30 years, it's more than this, oil and fuel. We are burning oil in Japan again. Can we criticize them? I don't think so. Can we help them in bringing more gas? Yes. Same in Germany. Today they prefer to say that it's coal and they, they use the fact that in terms of renewables they are far more advanced than others, but at the same time we all know they will have to switch to gas. And gas, you say it's more expensive than coal. Not everywhere. Mm -hmm. In the States it's cheaper. So it proved it can be cheaper somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And that's why in America they are not using coal anymore. All right. Thank you very much. Well, we are very pressed for time, but I, I would love to throw... Uh, Especially if I answer like this. <laughs> th throw it open to, uh, to the room now if anybody um, has some questions for, for Christophe. 
on the themes of, of climate change and the response of the, the energy industry. Uh, question down here. Um, we have a microphone. If we could have one down here. And if you have another question, somebody else get your hand up very quickly for Herman follow Herman Branson, EIG. Christoph, thank you for an excellent uh, um, presentation. Is the microphone on? Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'd like to refer to the issue of price range because we are now more optimistic. IEA gave a presentation yesterday, enormous optimism, and you have countries where you can produce the oil cheap, like in Iraq, and where you can produce the non-conventional expensively in America. What kind of minimum price range do we need to make this picture a reality? Well, uh, not so long ago, I would, I would answer, I mean, I don't have any crystal ball, so I would not answer. I think today we can answer. Not on the short term. Volatility is worse than ever, because volatility is not good. That's why I'm using the word worse. At the same time, more and more fundamentals are prevailing. What is making the cost of oil is the marginal cost of the last barrel you have to produce. That's very simple, but nobody wants to hear it. Now, it's true that you can, you can develop oil in Iraq at a far cheaper cost than in Angola or in Nigeria, and especially for unconventional, like uh, Atawaska. But as far as until, until you will need those unconventional, those unconventional will make the price. Why? Because that's life. Because if you stop this, today can you develop more conventional? Yes, you can in Iraq, but it will take time. And, and the concern at the end is the capacity you have to have sufficient available capacities. And when you see the numbers of problems we have on this planet, I will not give the list of all the countries with problems. That's why we cannot produce more. It's not because of resources. It's not because of reserves. It's because of security. It's because of uh, politics. It's because of environment, for good reasons. So at the end, till we will have to produce oil at $90, which is today probably the price where you have the marginal cost, it cannot go for a long period below this. Now on the top, as far as you have this famous premium risk, or risk premium, put it the way you like, which is usually around 20. Well, I mean, 90 plus 20 equal 110. OK, that's not my figure. We are a little bit more conservative than this. But don't be surprised if the price of oil today is at, us, at that level. With the concern you have about the Middle East, with the concern we have about what it's still called the Arab Spring, I mean, people are, and that's normal, ready to pay more for oil because oil is priority. And uh, you can add everything you want about speculators or traders. Those are responsible for the volatility, mm -hmm. but not for the fundamentals. So fundamentals is up to us. And I'd be happy to see that one day we could reduce the marginal cost. Because if we can do this, we will also be able to produce at a lower cost and then be able to provide oil at a lower price. Mm -hmm. But until further notice, that's the way it is. And we will continue. Because, I mean, we cannot only consider that we will bring oil from places where it is lower cost. So that's the reason. But again, it's not a crystal ball. It's just economy. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we have one more, one more question here. I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, Anna Halpern Landy, um, Shell, uh, working on upstream and especially renewables in the upstream. So. My question to you, sir, is this. Uh, if you, uh, you've, you've looked at several point uh, situations, and of course it's very difficult, uh, and, when renewable, and renewables are having to compete on a level playing field, let us say. But if you think about this from a systems perspective, yeah, and you think about what is it going to take to break, let's say, a leap forward to build infrastructure on a very large scale so that it comes down the cost curve, let's say, not just um, you know, why would we put one more solar panel on somebody's house? But how is it do you move an industrial sector uh, down this path? 
what is it that you think will be required, and what is the pathways that you see are most likely to be fruitful? Mm. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm not sure I'm the best to, to answer to this, but I'll try to my best. Um, be, before before you, can, you can go to larger scales, you have to prove that it's workable and profitable. Because nobody will accept, you know, the world is what it is, but nobody will accept to take the risk of saying, okay, we will build solar plants, solar farms on a huge size, because, I mean, it's true, normally it should be less costly per BTU. But I mean, who is going to take that risk before knowing if it is sustainable? You know, I take the example of Total. We have been investing in solar energy. We have been in investing in a company which is good company, Sun Power. We think they have the most advanced technologies. Okay, I mean, the company's value has been losing more than one billion in a year time. What can I say to my shareholders? and to my board, that I have a long-term vision, but I've already lost one billion, and now I'm ready to go in desert tech, which strongly, I will not come back on what I said two years ago here, because that was provocative. So I don't want to do this anymore. But before you go to large scales, you have to prove that it's working on a small scale. And even if you can, and you know that it will be better in bigger, it still need to be proved as working in smaller. And then you can preempt what could be the impact of larger scales, which means bigger quantities. But for the time being, you will never find investors, especially in the private sector, ready to invest billions without knowing if it is sustainable. Because, I mean, people will be fired before doing anything. And it's not because I am scared. I'm not scared. We did it. And I think I'm proud of what we did with Sun Power. But I mean, I have to be careful when I'm saying this to my shareholders, because they are not so proud and they are not so helping me on that. We will continue, because one billion compared to the more than 20 billion we spend every year on ENP. And globally, total, you know this. And it's probably part of why our shareholders sometimes are a little bit scary. We are spending before divestment something which is close to $30 billion a year. That's our commitment to before renewables, to energy, sustainability, and consumers. Okay, we, Your we're, perspectives we're, are incredibly invaluable. Thank, thanks for sharing those with us. Peter, do you want to finish? Yeah, well, just, just to say, I, th I think we've all been privileged to a, a customary mix of, of wit and wisdom from uh, Christopher on the pressing issue uh, of the day, is how we adapt to the... Uh, uh, to, to climate change and get our energy mix right, and how do we move that forward? Um, time is definitely over now. Uh, it's been flashing red here for nearly 10 minutes. So I, at this point, must hand back to the chairman. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you.